called Life in the Fast Lane with Lynette Louise, stand-up comic, mother of eight, prison performer. It's exciting being a part of my life. I have the most exciting life. I want anybody to laugh at me. Hi, I'm Arthur Kent. Tonight, a look at one woman's attempt to help children put their battered lives together at a time when social workers are finding it harder and harder to cope with the innocent victims of parental neglect or physical and sexual abuse. But Lynette Louise, singer and stand-up comedian, has her own highly unconventional ways to help her troubled children step by step. When I was about all in my bathroom, um, it was my prank, my bed, and, uh, and said that I wanted something to say to all children, and that I was going to do it right. I said I was trying to have a right prank, um, and I wanted to undo that. Are you? No. No, that's not fine. Lynn Louise, now 36, never reached her target of 12 kids, but she's close. She's got eight, and all with her eight acts, east of Toronto. Hello, Lynette speaking. Mm. This isn't the Brady Bunch. All of her children have been abused, four of them sexually. Two of them have learning disabilities. One suffers from fetal alcohol syndrome. Two are autistic. Lynette has two natural children, Tazara, aged 18, who was molested by a relative, and Brandessa, aged 16, who, like her sister, is a member of Lynette's comedy troupe. And there are six adopted children, two of them girls, J.D., 19, who after constant physical and emotional abuse, ran away from home when she was 15. Kaya, age 16, who was physically and sexually abused by a relative. And they all help Lynette care for the four boys. Dar, age 12, who is autistic. Cash, aged 11, who has a learning disability, and his two brothers, Chance, who's 10, and who when adopted had severe behavior problems and eight-year-old Rye, who is autistic, but not as severely as Dar. And there's Bailey, the dog. It's a household unlike any I've been in, a swirling, seething clamor of kids presided over by a single mother, a survivor of three bad marriages. These kids have all come from abusive homes, so that means they're not angels. That means they came into this house with baggage, and they dumped their baggage on us. They dumped it on me, they dumped it on their brothers, they dumped it on whoever was handy. But I was committed to them the moment I took them on, and they've managed to work that out. And part of that means when you get to the other end of it, and you look at these, the rest of the family who stuck by you, including your little brothers, um, then you start to give back to them, and they, res they respond to that. It's, I don't think that, it's, um, that my home is copyable. Yeah. I'll tell you some chocolates and some ticklets. Lynette Louise Center for Integrated Living. That's what it is. What's that? Lynette Louise Center for Integrated Living. I would appreciate it if we wouldn't just joke around because the noise is getting to him. Okay. Dar's level of autism makes him very dependent on Lynette. This one's much better. That's better. Keep going. Before she adopted him, she was told that he was retarded and might be partially deaf and blind. Keep going. He can speak, but chooses not to. He and Lynette communicate by using the alphabet. N, B. No, you're getting nervous. Dar picks out letters until they form words, eventually making sentences. Keep going. Use your eyes. Use your eyes. Use your eyes. Okay. When you're ready, when you're ready to spell so I can understand, then you come back and talk to me, okay? Because you're not making sense. Dar's tongue may be locked, but he has the vision of a poet. This is the very first thing that Dar ever wrote, um, as far as like creative writing. So it was deep in Dar's head is a contact C time capsule. It tick tick ticks and hurts his ears, especially when the world world's asleep. Those non drowsy tiny time pills tick all night long. Dar snuck into his mom's room for the cure, a kiss, but no one was there. So the capsule grew and grew and grew until the sound pushed out his mouth. He started to cluck and then to scream. Everyone woke and also screamed. Tick, 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 kapow. Mm -hmm. Baby's up! 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 Baby's
As well as eight children to care for, with some government assistance, Lynette Louise is also a grandmother. Tassara has a baby son, Jory, born in December. What's going on? What's all the people? Although she's a single parent, Tassara knows she can count on her family to care for her baby. There's a lot of support in this house. While we were filming, some of the kids had to go to the dentist for a checkup. Brush your teeth. Did you brush your teeth? Brush your teeth. Teeth. Brush them back. Brush them back. No, you don't need your snow pants, guys. We're going to the dentist. No snow pants. You don't need your snow pants. The girls quickly took over, organizing the younger boys. Now. They did it with that effortless bossiness, which seems to come naturally to big sisters. Okay, guys. Guys. Chip. Roy. Now. Now! Guys, come on, get ready. Come on, shoes, jacket, now. Are you coming? Oh, you went, you went. Okay, darling. Lynette was married when she began adopting her children. Since becoming single, she and her boisterous brood have moved six times, sometimes fleeing from hostile neighbors. There are two people inside Lynette Louise. One is organized, in control, happily disregarding convention. The other, a vulnerable, easily wounded woman, dismayed by other people's lack of compassion. Have any friends or social care workers ventured to risk pointing out to you <laughs> that there might be more conventional ways to bring up <laughs> ten children? Yes. I get in trouble all the time. And what do you tell them? I tell them that they're trying to put, um, they're trying to put conventional ideas on a non-conventional group. I can't use conventional methods. You can't say to somebody who's, um, whose father made them sexually active when they were four that, that they aren't allowed to kiss their boyfriend be until they're 16. You can't make the same expectations or rules. And that follows through in everything. Um, stupid. I would fail. I'd be butting my head against the wall with the kids and they'd be destroying the house and they wouldn't still be here, probably. Is it uncomfortable? at times to be different. Yeah. Yeah, most of the time, um, um, there have been a lot of times when um, I felt like, this is ridiculous. I'm willing to do this. Um, I'm not asking anybody else to do it for me or to help, but um, just don't make it harder. And it's, it's hard to watch your kids get called retard, you know. Who do you turn to for support, for help, when um, you feel that way? Mostly, um, mostly my kids. Today on Divorce Court. He can be blind to anything going on around him. It's hard to get his attention. Lynette started in show business acting in TV melodramas, most of them unmemorable. I know this is an old line, but haven't I seen you someplace before? You're right, it is an old line. I believe that we had lunch this afternoon. But four years ago, she drifted into improvisational stand-up comedy. She didn't want to be a comic. She wanted the experience of being on a stage in front of a live audience. My name is Lynette Louise. Those were the ladies in waiting. I, uh, all right, go ahead. Unlike other performers, Lynette often made her kids part of the act. Her life with them was the blood and bones of her humor. And if there's one thing I can't stand, it's sending my kids off to school after we've had a fight because I spend the whole day crying and they don't even remember. So, uh... Besides, I don't want to be that kind of a mom, so I decided, well, I better go over and apologize to the sweet, darling little tyke. So I trot on over to the bathroom and peek my head in, and there he is, glory, glory, hallelujah, teacher. And he's nowhere near the toilet bowl. <laughs> We're going to drive like this. Get the fuck away from me! But sometimes the mask would slip, revealing a woman whose life was passionately bound up with that of her children's. Um, 
this is the end of the show, and uh, I, I was just going to end the show on some jokes, um, but unfortunately, last Tuesday, my 11-year-old son, my 11-year-old autistic son, tried to commit suicide for the second time. When I was married to a very abusive husband, I found myself saying to him an awful lot, why can't you just be nice to me? It's a simple thing. So I guess I want to put those two things together and say that the way to love an autistic boy is to be nice enough to let him be who he is. So I'm sorry, I don't have a laugh for you to end on. Um, and it was selfish of me, but I needed it. Thank you and good night. For any place that has a prison that happens to line up with our tour, I'm uh, offering the service of having us come in and do a show, and I was wondering if you'd be interested. Not surprisingly, Lynette Louise empathizes with people living on the edge of society. She's been taking her show to Canadian prisons, and has just begun a magical mystery tour of jails across the United States. Excuse my ignorance, but what state am I calling? I've been calling so many. <laughs> Lining up the tour, Lynette sometimes had to assure prison officials that she and her daughters were not strippers. Before her tour, Lynette and her daughters went to Winnipeg to perform at a jail on the outskirts of the city. It was a 24-hour train trip, but they got there in sprightly good humor. There was a surprise at the station. Lynette's mother, Amy, was waiting to meet them, and she was seeing her grandson for the very first time. Grandma, hey, Grandma. Oh, my God. Jordy. Hey, sweetheart. Jordy. He's sleeping. He does that a lot. The next day, Lynette Louise and her ladies-in-waiting arrive at medium security Stony Mountain Prison. Neither the guards nor the inmates, 40% of whom are Aboriginal, quite know what to expect. The inmates warm to her, perhaps sensing a kindred spirit. Okay, my name is Lynette Louise, and before I get started, I think I'm going to do a song that's my favorite song. Um, I've just remade it. It's on a CD that'll be coming out this month. Please, if you get out, or if you have any friends... <laughs> Okay? I need the revenue. She's no Robin Williams, but it doesn't matter. She knows how to connect. excellent audience they they come in they're wanting to have a good time even the ones who insist on being tough and you know they'll be there'll be a couple who will just sit there stony-faced and they won't smile because you know that wouldn't be cool but 
You can feel them with you the whole time. You're not fighting for them. And they run to the nearest beach and they get a stone and they come back with it. And they put it in the pot and they add some water. And, and she's got a message that the prisoners are going to hear whether they like it or not. She tells the story of the villagers who turn a cauldron of boiling water and a stone into a thick, nutritious soup. It's a simple message about sharing. And they stir and they stir. And then the one guy says to the other guy, it's almost ready. But boy, you know what would make this good? Just a couple of carrots. Like, oh, oh, I have some carrots. And then the guy runs away and he gets some carrots. And by this time, they've got a great big, huge crowd around them. So he says, well, you know, some onions. And then somebody gets onions and somebody gets turnip and somebody gets potatoes. And the next thing you know, you have this huge pot of vegetable stew. And so the guys take it and they pass it out to everybody, you know. And everybody eats it and they say, Oh my God, it's delicious. And imagine with only a stone. There's barely a dry eye in the house. For Lynette Louise, this trip is very much a homecoming. Even the jail, where her third husband was an inmate, is familiar. She grew up nearby in the tiny town of Selkirk, where her best friend Connie and her husband Brent still live. <laughs> Connie and Lynette share memories that go back to when they were young girls, loving and fighting and facing life together. Oh my God, that's Connie, everybody, the little baby. Oh, adorable. Oh my God, these are so. Oh, there's Kim. Oh, Kim. I was so jealous of Kim because you loved Kim better than me. You met Kim in grade seven, and you Great never eight. liked me anymore. <laughs> I didn't like anybody anymore. They don't see each other very often, but when they do, they free fall into a sunlit valley of shared memories. Connie remembers that she and her friends always knew that Lynette would one day take flight. There was always something more. There was always something restless, something maybe bothering her. I don't know quite what, but like she had to get out of Selkirk, it seemed. She had to leave. She had to go do all these things. And that's why I say everyone kind of knows her because, because she w restless is the only word I can think of. Lynette returned to Selkirk when Brandessa and Tassara were little. Connie went abroad and lost touch with Lynette for some years. A year ago in the summer, she was here with all of her kids. And I saw her with them, and I was absolutely amazed that, that Lynette, you know, like kind of crazy Lynette, had all these kids, and she was such a good mom. I, I, and, and I'm not saying that to be mean. I just never thought that she... I didn't think she'd be responsible enough to have all these kids, but she was so good with them. I couldn't, I was just, I was so impressed. Yeah, you were a really cute little kid. You were very strange, even at four and five. I can remember you saying how you wanted to be an angel. Lynette and her mother, Amy, have a tense, uneasy relationship. Amy, now a widow, still has a lot of trouble accepting her daughter's decision to adopt so many abused and neglected children. I was horrified because she, I felt she had many things herself that she had to solve. And she hadn't solved them. And I thought she put undue responsibility on the girls, on Tassar and Randessa. So as much as I know she's wonderful with children, and she is, there's no doubt about it, I felt that was a big lot of baggage for her. Amy feels that Lynette's two natural daughters have been propelled into a maturity beyond their years. She described Brandessa as 16 going on 61. I think our lives have made us grow up too fast. 
Definitely. Oh, well, yeah. So it, when my grandmother says that she's 16 going on mm -hmm. 61, I'd say that, that was could before. Be <laughs> it like, had nothing to do with the... Yeah, it could be true, but it's not because she's true. working in a comedy show. It's because of the things that have happened to us before. And now yeah. now that yeah. she is, say, going on 61, she can handle being in a troop. <laughs> so I don't think it's making her go up too fast. But going into a prison, a lot of young women dealing with men on the outside is difficult enough. Even in a school or, you know in social circumstance but you're oh, no. you're facing oh, you're facing a pretty seriously adult crowd in those prisons how do you cope with that you forget when you go totally you forget they're just about they're just another audience a really great audience a captive audience <laughs> There, yeah. I, I've only done one prison, and that was Stony Mountain, and I loved it. Do you feel like you've accomplished something, given them something with your show? Yes. Yeah, definitely. That's yes. exactly how yes. you feel afterwards. You have a great sense of pride, I guess, afterwards, because they appreciate you so much. You, you certainly do feel feel really good, especially when they come up to you after and they thank you so much, you know, yeah. just that was really yeah. nice of you to come do that for yeah. us. That, and was, like, that was super nice. Yeah. Yeah. So. They really appreciate you. Well, I want to give it to the guard and let them deal with it. <laughs> and all their lives keep revolving. Lynette's just released a CD and a music video, which she promoted at Toronto's Squeeze Club. She hopes that the sales will enable her to become self-supporting, free from government assistance. It's a risk, but she thrives on risk. That's why she's taking her entire family on the biggest adventure of their lives so far. Take your boots off when you get in, please. Okay. Set your boots to the side. They're going to at least 20 American prisons, finishing up eventually in Calgary. If I fall here one more time, I'm going to scream. Lynette will do most of the driving, despite being on crutches after falling on ice. The gang will be gone for two months. It'll be just another step in this extraordinary family's emotional odyssey. We're like a group therapy, you know, here. So there's this constant healing going on, and there's this constant reaching for better and better um, health, emotional health. So. Even though they're, you know, I don't want to paint a picture of, oh, that poor family, because it's just the opposite. We're wonderful. Like, we're, it's exciting being a part of my life. I have the most exciting life. I don't know anybody with a life like mine. You know, I've got, I've got all these kids who love me. I've got, I've got these huge challenges on, on a daily basis. I'm in charge of everything that happened to my life. And even in the things when you're attacked from the outside world, you know, something goes wrong and you have to deal with it, um, I'm still in charge of the choices that we make that way. And it's wonderful. I have a great life.